Hello everyone and welcome to this session, What are Positive Behavior Plans and How Do You Create One? Presented by Heather Robison, brought to you by Simple K-12. I'm Kimberly Warner from Simple K-12, Kimber here on the right hand side, and I would love it if you join us for some upcoming webinars. You can register for those inside the teacher learning community. For a limited time, all of those upcoming live webinars free and open to the public, so take advantage of that free webinar registration, and I hope to see you there. I did send out a tweet a couple minutes ago on Twitter inviting my followers to join in this live session for free. You're welcome to retweet what I sent out or send something of your own. Most important part is going to be that link so they can join for free and of course the hashtag pound as K12 so we can all collaborate on Twitter. There's also a live back channel going on right now. This is where you can chat and take notes with other live attendees during the session. It's a lot of fun. It's also optional. Don't feel like you must participate um, but if nothing else jot down this link and you can always access a copy of this back channel later on inside the teacher learning community's shared resources. It takes us about one to two weeks to archive those. We'll have a very short amount of time for questions at the close of the webinar, so if you do have a question for Heather, go ahead and put that in the GoToWebinar questions box. It'll be towards the top right of your screen. It does tend to auto collapse, so open it up with that red orange arrow, put your question or comment in there, and I'll tend to all of those. Make sure Heather gets the questions that you ask her. Final thing before we turn it over to Heather, please let us know what your title is so we can learn a little bit more about you. While you do that, I'll let you know a little bit more about Heather. She has her master's in elementary education. She's a special education teacher in Monongalia School District, West Virginia, and she's uh, been around Simple K-12 for a while now. We know her pretty well, actually, but this is, in fact, her first webinar with us, so we're happy to have her come on today and share some of the experiences she's had with positive behavior plans. So we'll go ahead and look at the poll results here. Lots of wonderful teachers on 76%, a couple of other people on as well. No matter what your title is, it's wonderful to have you on the session today. And a big welcome to you, Heather. Great to have you. I'm passing you the screen now. Looks great. Excellent. There we go. All right, so like Kimber said, uh, I teach in Monongalia County Schools, just for pronunciation's sake, in West Virginia. And um, I lucked into my job last year at two schools, and this upcoming year is my second year teaching, and I'll be working at one school with solely autistic children, possibly a couple of our other ones, but I'm really excited to be working with my autistic kiddos. Um, just a little bit about me, I'm a traveler. My husband was overseas for two and a half years, and I, I wouldn't stop traveling ever. I love summer break simply for that at this point. I'm an avid reader, and I'm a Hobie alum, which is a leadership conference that I actually get to do with high school sophomores every year, and that is completely separate from my actual teaching career. So. Um, I didn't get to ask Kimber this before we started, but um, did you happen to get that poll up that I asked? Oh, yes, I have it here. Would you like me to put it up now, Kimber? Heather? All right. Yeah, uh, real quick, I'd like to just have a poll so that I can see uh, what kind of crowd I'm talking to here so that I know if I'm talking too basic or too advanced. <laughs> sure. I just put that up, and we'll let everyone vote here, and it says... How much experience do you have with positive behavior plans? And it goes from none all the way up to I've written more than I can count. So we'll just give everyone a couple more seconds to vote here, and then I'll read out the results for you. Thank you so much. And make sure everyone click that Submit button. I forget it all the time. After you click <laughs> your option, you have to click Submit. <laughs> That's a good tip there. Okay, so let's go ahead. I'll, I'll share here. And for your sake, Heather, I'll read these out. 28% none at all, 24% I've seen students with folders or plans, 14% I fill out the folders, 31% I've had to write a few, and 3% I've written more than I want to count. So pretty pretty good distribution, actually. It really is. It's going to be challenging for you, Heather. <laughs> well, that's good for me because, you know, 
being my first year of teaching, I was thrown into the fire, and I had to write one within probably the first two months of actually teaching. And I went, well, how, what, why? <laughs> so uh, this, would be a good, this would be a good thing for me. Um, my biggest thing right now that I tell people is I learned more in the first year of teaching than I did in six years of college, which I'm sure most of you can appreciate and understand fully. Uh, you learn a lot from your kiddos more than you do in a, in a college classroom, in a college setting. So, let me, let's just get started here. Well, this time, of course, we have to review a little bit what are positive behavior plans, and I found the Wikipedia definition, which I thought was hilarious, and it's, my citations aren't properly done, but they are in there, so you know where I got my information. Wikipedia says, Positive behavior supports strive to use a system to understand what maintains an individual's challenging behavior. Students' inappropriate behaviors are difficult to change because they are functional. They serve a purpose for the child. These behaviors are supported by reinforcement in the environment. And the key for me in this statement is knowing that many things can be perceived as reinforcement to a behavior. What you may think of as punishment for the child could actually be a reinforcement in their minds. So it's important to know that when you're making these, it's not always clear cut what's good and bad for the student. And uh, I had to learn that extremely quickly when I uh, started writing them for my kiddos. So when exactly do I use them? Well, most schools already have a positive behavior plan in place for all the students. Um, however, my kiddos need more than the basics that everyone is getting, so I use them anytime I want to shape a struggling child. All of my kiddos with a more severe diagnosis have a plan in place because they simply don't understand social cues and norms that are present in every situation. And the plan helps give them a more rigid and defined structure to use and lean on. So those are the kids that, you know, don't understand why they can't be first in line while well, they're going to have a plan in place to prevent them from doing things if they're physical. If they're concrete thinkers, my kids have visual schedules and visual plans in place that they can look at it and go and see what they're responsible for and what they're actually supposed to do. So before you even get started writing a plan, you have to identify a few things. And the first thing you have to identify is the behavior. Why should you identify the behavior? Well, you can't create any kind of reinforcement if you don't know why the child is acting out. One of the most common examples that I've seen in books, online, and in real life is when an autistic student is sound sensitive. So you take them to the gym for an award ceremony or a reward of some type, and the student ends up running out of the gym screaming or uncovering their ears. And this generally leads to a teacher and an adult running after them and yelling to get them. And then sometimes they're even disciplined, which is yet another loud noise this child is now having to take in. And at that point, you completely shut the child down. And this is a fine line for our kids because this can make the difference in if that student never listens to you again. I mean, you could spend the rest of the day recovering from that behavior rather than teaching them the next steps to improvement. So it's important that you know why they're behaving the way they are, which leads to the function of behavior. Um, one of the issues that I actually had to address with one was when student one pushed student two. And this didn't happen just once. It happened repeatedly every day for, for a very long time, unfortunately. And since I was only there a half day, I couldn't actually see what was happening at the other times I was being told he was being aggressive. So as it turns out, student two was actually provoking student one by blowing on him or trying pretending to walk towards him, things that the first student didn't like. And it took us about two weeks to figure this out. So a lot of watching and a lot of, a lot of communication between me and all the aides working with these children and going, what is happening here? And all the adults involved with the students were just yelling at the first student and placing him in timeout. And this was an attention-seeking behavior, so now he's been rewarded in his mind, even though he's in trouble. So since he was getting what he wanted, which was adult attention, he kept doing it, and it took us about two months to retrain him not to push his friends. And it was not an easy task. So, and that's replacement behaviors. We want them to do something different that's 
equally inviting to them. So if a student gets attention for pushing a student and we would rather give them attention for staying in their seat, that means that when that child is properly sitting in their seat, you need to praise them and give them the adult attention they're looking for. One of the first things we did to change this without, before we even wrote the behavior plan, because at all costs, if you don't have to write it, don't. It's a legally binding document in their IEP and it has to be followed. So if you can avoid it by making some simple changes, I highly encourage it. And the first thing is just changing the environment. Can you move your kid's desk? Well, in most cases, I hope so. I know in some places you can't. But generally, if you can move the student's desk away from the problem, it solves a lot of issues. Um, can you rotate groups? Some kids don't work well together. Uh, in one classroom, I had two autistic kiddos put together, and they were always grouped together. And we said they need to be split up. And we did it. And life got better for all of us, which was a huge change. Can you turn your computer monitors off when they're not in use? Especially if you have the old ones. I don't know if any of you are as sensitive as I am. I went into my classroom and my kiddo was just off the wall. Couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. He just had his hands on his ears, wouldn't do any of his work. So I paused for about a minute and listened. And I could hear the whine of the computer monitor. Now, if I had to think about it and listen for it, he's hearing it without even trying. And it was a distraction for him. So it's important that you notice these things that, that are an issue for them. Another one is alternative lighting. Can you just change the lighting in the room? Get a lamp, get a desk lamp. Can you ask your administrators to change the grading on the fluorescent lights? We had one incident where the kids were at the class was finishing a worksheet, and my kiddo hadn't finished yet. But since most of the class was done, the kids were going to sit up and watch a video, so the teacher went and turned off the light. Well, of course, my kid's not done working, so he gets up and goes over and turns the light back on, sits back down. <laughs> now, he's also sound sensitive, so of course he gets yelled at by the class for doing this, and the teacher even disciplines him. And then I had to remove him from the room because now we had a temper tantrum. And we spent a lot of time de-escalating and trying to bring him back down. Could we have fixed this? Yes, if he'd had another light or if he'd been told that he could finish it later, we had to watch a video now, he would have been fine. But since there was no prompting or leading to it, he just he went off the rocker. And it's, just, it's something so simple as just letting them know what's happening. You can always try to change the environment first. The next thing you need to look at is you. This is a picture of my Hobie staff. These are all the adults that I actually get to work with with our high school sophomores. And, um, we do assessment daily during the conference, um, middle of the day breaks, every night. We do it constantly. And while I'm sure most of you look at yourself every day trying to figure out how you can improve, what you can do better, I also know that you know of teachers that look at everybody else first. They will never look at themselves as the center of the blame. They'll never say, well, if I had done something differently, they'll go, well, if this student hadn't done this which is your next thing. You want to look at your students. So you need to do self-evaluation and student evaluations just to see where your kids are at and what's causing the problems. So now we're going to talk a little bit about pivotal response. Pivotal response is something that I don't actually use in the daily terms, but I discovered that I do everything that it is. Um, <laughs> These are responses that become generalized and improve in other areas of behavior. So if you've got your kiddo saying good morning to one teacher, you want them saying good morning to every teacher in the morning, or maybe mom and dad when they get up, or their classmates when they get to the classroom. So you want this to be a generalized response, something that they do everywhere, not just in one situation. It's also good if they have naturally occurring consequences. And what that means is that you want something to happen naturally. It should be in the flow of the day. So, for instance, when I reward my kids, we do things like uh, once math class is over, we can go outside. And in our mind, we're thinking, well, that's because recess is right after math, but, you know, we need to get our math work done. You don't tell the student that. You just know that. So once you, once you finish your math sheet, we can go outside. And maybe they finish it early, and you can take them out a little early. And that would be an even more immediate response that really doesn't interfere with their day. 
as opposed to saying, well, once you finish this, we can go out for sensory time. If you're pulling them out for extra things or giving them something that you can't actually do on a regular basis, it's not as, it doesn't stick as well. They're not likely to do as much, do what you want as often if you're giving them something like a sticker every time. You want them to start getting that intrinsic reward response as they're generalizing their response, their uh, actions. My lights just flickered, so I'm sorry I stuttered. So let's take a look. We're going to look at some the pivotal response, some interventions, and some examples. So let's talk about motivation. Um, we all know it's a challenge to motivate kids, and you don't have to actually copy this chart if you're taking notes in the back channel. I'm going to post my presentation in the shared uh, resources at the end of this. So motivation, you want to provide the child those choices. One of the biggest things that worked for a specific kiddo of mine was giving him options. We went from every morning from yelling at me and telling me, calling me all sorts of things, to I just, I just changed the way we did our layout. He would come in and get his break. He needed a sensory break every morning. And then I said, I'd always have two or three things that I wanted to get done. And I would tell him, you know, I want to finish these things, but you get to choose what you want to do first. So you can do a grammar sheet, a math sheet, or we can do this activity. And he could pick, and the idea would be to get at least two of the three done every day, because I knew that's what he was capable of. But if we could get three done, it was a really good day. And if you want to talk about an adjustment, we went from yelling at me every morning and spending 15 to 20 minutes of trying to bring him down to instantly coming in and getting work done and getting rewarded, which is exactly what he wanted. He wanted adult approval. And by coming in and doing that and getting to choose, he got that approval and he did much better. So you need to vary maintenance tasks with new tasks. This is the old and the new. You want to make sure that when you're putting a strain on the child, that you're not putting too much strain on the child. So if they're learning a new concept like double digit addition, but they're struggling, then take a step back and go back to single digit for a little while. The kids prefer it, and it reminds them that they can do it, which is something that our, that our kids tend to forget almost, that they, they know how to do it, but now we're just asking them to do something a little more, hard, a little more challenging. So it's important that they know that you know they can do it, and then you tell them or show them that they can do it by giving them a task that's more within their capabilities. And the next thing you want to do is reinforce and use natural reinforcers. I like the idea of telling time. You can have the kids tell them what time your favorite TV show is. Um, if they like money and you're learning and you're teaching money, you can have them buy their favorite item from the class store. Little things like that to just help them to learn these new concepts. And verbal praise cannot be outdone. Um, I have one kid that doesn't like verbal praise, but he likes stars on his paper. Simply put, we just started drawing stars and everything he finished, whether it was right or wrong, didn't matter. He got a star for completion. And I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about him when I start talking about the first plan that I had to write. Using multiple cues is a big deal. Um, something that I had a hard time telling, working with my teachers with was test options. You know, rather than saying here's 20 multiple choice questions, you don't get any modifications, you need to complete it, versus here are three short answer questions, you only have to answer two of the three. By giving the kids these choices and these different kinds of cues, they're actually more likely to give you an answer that you're looking for and an answer that they're strong in and confident in. And then you want to teach question asking. To avoid this wonderful crying behavior and get more of this, this smiling and the happiness, you want them to raise their hands and ask questions. Now, I do this simply by modeling, where we're reading something and I'll ask the questions out loud and then we'll model the answers out loud so that they understand what's going on. Self-management is one of the last things that you can do, and I like doing it a lot. It's simply having the kid keep track of what you want them to keep track of. Um, 
say you have a student that can't sit still in group circle time or a large group time, you can give them something to do during that that's not going to interfere with the other students and it's really not going to take away from what the activity, it's just going to give them something to do. So an example that I found was during group reading time where you have all your kids on the floor and you're reading the group together, you can have the kid mark down page turns so they know how many pages are in the book. Something just very simple for them to do and they can and it keeps them sitting and quiet and attentive even if it's not quite on what you think it should be. One of the things that I noticed very quickly was that they're generally paying more attention than you think they are. So <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about my first behavior plan and to give you a little background on my kiddo um, I was told when I walked in, he has always been this way, he will always be this way, there's nothing we can do to fix him. Which I'm sure some of you are sitting there going, you've got to be kidding me. Which is my reaction when I heard that was, are you kidding me? Um, his behavior plan that was in place was written at the beginning of his first grade year and I got him at third grade. So nothing had been updated since basically the end of kindergarten. And I found that to be unacceptable because he obviously needed improvements. So it was important that you make sure that the goals are in the interest of the child, not the staff or any of the other students, but that sole child. Because there's no reason to write a goal that that child will never meet. So this is actually directly from the behavior plan. We targeted three um, three behaviors that we wanted to fix. And what we ended up doing was identifying the behavior, which was interact appropriately with adults and peers, and we had to have replacement behaviors. So what defines interacting appropriately with adults? That means that the child was yelling at above a conversational level, he was threatening, name calling, there were some physical aggressions, uh, limit examples but not limited to being punching, hitting, and headbutting, uh, and pinching. He had a pinching issue. We also had a fun time with stabbing at one point with pencils. And so we wanted to replace this behavior. Well, we wanted to replace this by to get attention. We wanted him to raise his hand and use a calm voice, which is significantly different than yelling out. And we also wanted him to request sensory breaks if he was feeling overwhelmed rather than pinching because that's what that was. Every time he started pinching us it was when he was getting overwhelmed and we needed to reset for him. The next thing that we wanted to replace was the task refusal which was generally done with him saying no I won't and he would just go and lay his head down. Now while some of us are going that's fine you can leave your head down for a few minutes when that happens for two weeks at a time, it, you don't accomplish anything and then you don't have any data on your students or their goals. So we want to replace that by having him attempt and complete tasks when prompted by an adult. We started this off with just the attempt and it actually the replacement behavior was having him start with less than two prompts. And if he started it, he would get an immediate approval, you know, you're doing such a good job, we're glad you started this, you know, here's a star, thank you for starting this. Just things like that. You're sitting so well. I'm glad you started this worksheet. Simplest thing ever. Solved a lot of problems. The last thing we wanted to help him do was transition properly. We had a lot of loud behaviors, some stomping and screaming, and I'm sure some of you that work with these kids can relate. There was some yelling. He hit the lockers on his way out. So in order to replace that, we wanted him to enter and exit a room with two or less prompts and same with in-class activities. We wanted him to go to these things without having any issues. So to prevent this, now this is the key that I discovered and this is also where I had the biggest problems getting adults on board. You want to do the prevention strategies. You have to have them, you have to do them, everyone has to do them. If two people interact with the student, then those two people need to be spot on every time. If nine people interact with that student, those nine people have to do it too. And this is why it took us longer to get some of these things to fade because he wasn't getting rewarded. Simply by the second one on there. 
student will be rewarded based on starting and completing tasks. All he wanted was adult approval. That's all he wants. He just wants you to say, you're doing a good job. I'm so proud of you. When I did that with him, I got more work done with that child than I had all year in probably a matter of one month. When I would come back the next morning and my aide would tell me they had such a horrible afternoon and I'd look at his chart and go, well, he, he did well during this half hour? And they'd say, yes. Say, what did he get as a reward? Oh, well, we didn't. We didn't have time. That's not acceptable. He's supposed to get a reward every half hour. Therefore, he gets a reward every half hour if he does well. So it's just little things like that. You know, everybody has to be on board with this. Anytime he was on task, we wanted the general classroom teacher to praise him, not just the special educator or the aide that's with him. We wanted all the adults in the room to do it so that he knows he's being seen, he's doing something right, and he deserves some praise for that. And then to prevent the aggressions, we gave him scheduled breaks every morning and afternoon. And we wanted to give him the opportunity to get some of that energy out, which is where the, the rewards every half hour came in and the immediate reward response came in as well. This was his immediate response. I had the staff had a different chart than he did. And this was his. Now, the trick to his, those are the three things we wanted him to do. Nice words, quiet hands and feet, and task complete. If he got one, two, three, four, five stars in one row and he got to the success, he could pick a reward. And he had a reward chart that had things like a sensory break, five minutes of computer time, read a book of his choice, free draw, anything he wanted, basically. And he could pick from that for about five minutes and have a reward. He didn't need five in each row. He just needed five in one. So one day, and I, I really feel that this was not done properly because realistically, he should have had this filled every day. But for some reason, if he wasn't with me, he didn't get stars. And it really frustrated me because all of his teachers knew that he had this and he carried it with him. So not only did he have this folder with his reward chart and these sheets, the aide or the teacher with him also had a clipboard with a different document, different documenting that we were using in order to take data and have it on file. But this was his, and we saw a complete jump. I mean, we went from 50% improvement to 90% improvement in a matter of one month. I know I'm running out of time very quickly. Um, <laughs> one of the last things that we need to consider is the crisis procedure and what happens when things happen. So if he had any yelling, was aggressive at all, had any screaming, any aggressions, anything of the sort, he was to go into timeout immediately for three minutes. <laughs> uh, this clock would reset any time he escalated. So any time that he escalated, so if you took him outside and you set it down and he started yelling at you, you'd stop it and wait until he finished yelling, reset it to start again. And it resets three. It doesn't just pick up where it left off. It resets to three. And this is another thing that wasn't followed entirely, and I wish it had been because it was making progress. Um, if he exceeded a 30-minute timeout in one sitting or he had more than three different times during the day he got pulled, we had to tell his, his mother. And that was a tedious task for us, but she appreciated it, and it actually improved the parent relationship as well as the relationship to the, to the kiddo. This was the chart that we used for him that the teachers used. I keep forgetting you can't see me point to my screen. Um, <laughs> we had it set up for every half hour. If he succeeded, we were to circle the yes. And all of the behaviors were at the bottom. Now, this chart took probably two weeks to develop until everybody was happy with it because there's a comment section at the bottom, which is what this is for. So you could write down the letter, and you could say why there's a no. Ideally, if the any N is circled, there should be a description of what happened because it's important to know where the kiddo was and what happened with him. So the next thing I wanted was I wanted to know what he had earned, and that was a huge issue because if he got all yeses, he should have earned a reward. 
and a lot of times that just didn't happen and that was where our downfall was. So simply to wrap up, uh, the, uh, the whole point of having the positive behavior plan is to make sure everybody's on board and that you know that everyone's doing it and so the kids behavior improves. And I know I'm about out of time so if you have any questions feel free to ask. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heather. I'm going to go ahead and pull the screen back real quick. Those of you who have questions, now is the time to write those in. Use that GoToWebinar questions box for entering your questions. I want to remind you all to leave a rating and review on this session. It's just flipped over to On Demand here. You can find it in the Webinars tab and um, look for it there. Also remind you that we do have that 40% off discount going until midnight tonight if you have any questions about that. Happy to stay on extra after the webinar today to help you out with those. And like Heather said, please connect with her inside the teacher learning community and on Twitter as well. Uh, join us at some upcoming webinars and here's some links to the discount and the back channel discussion as well. Christine has a question here for you. She okay. says, I like the concept of having positive plans for changing student behaviors, but I found that with classrooms of 32 students where seven have special needs and more than one student may have a different plan, it's hard to manage it all. What suggestions do you have for me? Uh, my first question is, are you, a, you must be the general education classroom teacher. Um, <laughs> the basic way I would look at that uh, is take a look at the kiddos' plans. I know the special educator, or if you're a special educator, you've had to read over all the things. Um, you might want to try and find some similarities or basic things that you can do that would better, that would benefit all of those students without really interfering with your teaching style. So if you've got, you know, I've seen classrooms like that where we had 20 kids and 15 of them had, you know, an IEP with a behavior plan and the teacher went nuts, I'm not going to lie, she's actually not coming back next year, she was overstressed. Um, I would say talk with your coworkers because they're also going to be in the same stress level. And then, like I said, just try and find something that's that's simple to do. Can you hear my thunder? That's crazy. Uh, <laughs> to find something that's simple to do. Um, a lot of them have very similar things in their IEPs. Like, you know, no, in small groups they can't be together. Well, that's fine. You know, just separate them into different groups. Uh, they might be working on the same social skills, and you can actually build some of those into the lessons. Uh, just, wonder, just, wonderful. And I do want to reiterate that you will be sharing your PowerPoint in the shared resources, right, Heather? Yes. If I don't do it tonight, I will do it tomorrow. Okay, okay <laughs> that sounds good. A couple people have asked about that. And, and actually, in my PowerPoint, there's another example as well that I didn't have time to get to. But So you'll have two, two examples of behavior plans that I had to write. Great. And Joe says, have you ever had any trouble getting the administration to buy into your plan? Never. Um, <laughs> I actually had a discussion with my administrators because I was told by my coworkers that they would never do it. And, uh, well, of course, you can imagine my doubts in that. So I sat down with my administrators and they said, if you write it, we stand by it. So I've, I have honestly never had any issues. Okay, and then Tina is asking, do you have meetings with other teachers on a regular basis to ensure everyone is on the same page? As much as I would like to say yes to that, um, <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the mornings before school would start going to each teacher as I needed to. Uh, when they did structured teacher planning, that would come up. That way we were definitely discussing the issues that were coming up with my kiddos specifically. But I, I always wish there was more time to discuss this and to follow up on it especially because you can introduce it in these meetings and then you never get a follow-up session to see how everyone's dealing with it. So it's, I think it'll improve over time ultimately. And could you touch on, I think you brought this up actually at the very beginning, Heather, um, about not writing a, an improvement plan unless you absolutely need to. Could you touch on that again, Kathy? You just had a question on what you meant by that. Um, ultimately, you have to understand, I mean, we know IEPs are legally binding, and if you put a behavior plan in that, it is legally binding. And if your signature is on that piece of paper, that plan had better be followed every single day you're with that kid. And 
if you can avoid having that legal, like that legal conscience on your shoulders, I'd say do it. And I was actually extremely hesitant to write my last one last year because I felt that if we had just had more time, we had to write it at the end of you know, the middle of May, which is very poor timing. But I felt that if we had just given it a little more time, he would have been fine without it. But since we had to mark there was a behavior problem on his IEP, we had to write the behavior plan. And now we're accountable for that at all times. So then you have to have the data charts to go with it, and you have to make sure you're monitoring the progress. Ultimately, so, it boils down to a lot of extra paperwork that mm -hmm. you really don't need to do if you don't have to. <laughs> so, so if you can help the student without necessarily going through all Let's of that, you'd recommend it. Definitely. Okay. And that's great. And that <laughs> is it for the questions, which is great because we're pretty much out of time here. Thanks, everyone, for coming on. And a huge thank, thank you to you, you Heather. So, so it's great. Thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. Thanks.